Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, our series on Traveling Light. Today, we're going to be dealing specifically with the topic of shame. And unfortunately, I have um, some familiarity with this particular topic, but we've got some friends here that are gonna walk with me and I'm gonna walk with them through this. And we also have a therapist, uh, Lauren Coates has joined us here and she is from uh, Rockwall Counseling and Wellness and uh, she owns that practice and has several other therapists that work with her there, so we're really lucky to have the principal uh, <laughs> with us, uh, or the CEO, whatever you wanna call it, uh, here with us today. And so, uh, and she is married to uh, one of our co-pastors, um, Casey Coates, which is, really makes total sense because God knew that Casey needed a full-time therapist, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which actually would be totally awesome. I've got the highest regard for therapists, and so, so, and I think this session really lends itself to unpacking uh, in front of a therapist. So I wanna be honest uh, that we're gonna be willing to do that today and, and we're gonna be vulnerable and transparent and uh, we're trusting you with this information so we certainly trust what you, what you do with it. So let me just ask the question real simply. How many people have something in the past um, that you are tempted to return back to over and over again uh, that you feel like is shameful? I mean, I'm raising my hand because I'm one of them, that you feel like is shameful. I just wanna see, okay, that's most of us. So would anybody be willing to just kind of jump out there and, and share either what that does or what it is? So for about 30 years, I have struggled with lust and pornography. Mm. Um, the first 28 of those years, nobody in the world knew it but me. Mm. Mm. And um, it was the shame that kept me silent uh, and from seeking help. Um, and it was just, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I, it's one of the rare occasions in this area where I actually followed the spirit and uh, confessed mm. to a friend. Mm. Um, awesome. And just the relief that that one act brought, I knew that this was something that I had to deal with. Um, but I continued another year without telling anybody else, including my wife. Um, in fact, I was in counseling at the time for, for some other stuff, social anxiety stuff, and um, actually stopped going to counseling because I knew I couldn't avoid it if I went. Yeah. Um, and it was all because of the shame. And um, I didn't realize the effect it had until it was gone. Um, I didn't realize what a wall it had built up between me and Andrea, just this, this secret I had, this, this shame. And... Um, just the difference now is is unbelievable. Well, wow. yeah, they say shame lives in the dark. Yeah. So I don't know if it's necessarily something I've completely overcome. Um, you hear it all the time on social media and in the news, but mom shame is kind of a big deal right now. And it's not just necessarily mom shaming moms, but it's mom shaming themselves. And um, I am a working mom. I love my job. I'm very active. I'm a fitness instructor. I want to be involved in everything all the time, always. And there are a lot of times that I still struggle with feeling shame that I'm not spending enough time with my children, with my husband, with my family, just in general. Um, and it's something that I really struggle with because I want to be it all. But I lay down in bed at night and I really feel that shame of, am I being who I should be for the people that are most important in my life, or am I being who I want to be? So I don't know that I've necessarily overcome it, but it's something that I pray about. It's something that I seek other moms and other spiritual leaders um, with guidance, but it's, it's definitely something that I struggle with. How long did you kind of live with that in secret before you said it out loud to From someone? the day my daughter was born. <laughs> and she's <Yeah>. five now. <laughs> um, it's, it's taken a while. I think it took us until, honestly, until we moved here to Sunnyvale two years ago. Um, I live next door to my parents, and um, my mom was the mom that did it all. 
And so I feel like I should be able to do that. And she was an amazing mom. She gave us an amazing life. And there are times that I'm like, how did she do it? And have you ever asked her if she felt like she wasn't doing it all? No, honestly, because I felt like, I mean, the answer, I, I feel like her answer would be, yeah, I did it all because mm. she did. She did it all. And I know the reality of it is you can't do it all. But um, but then you do hear the the mom shaming, the mom shaming other moms. Like, oh, well, for spirit day, you didn't dress your daughter up, you know? And <laughs> you feel so shameful as a mom because you just needed a break or you wanted to snuggle a little bit longer that night instead. Or you just forgot. Or you just <laughs> forgot. Like, the tooth fairy needs to come tonight. I can't forget, you know? <laughs> but that that shame, that mom shame, it's, it's a real thing that I struggle with for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I bet you if you were to ask your mom, she would say that she felt that same way at times. Too. Probably. On one hand, you said she did it all. On the other hand, you said you can't do it all. Yeah, it's true. I imagine your kids probably feel the same way about you that you felt about your mom, which is that you're doing it all. I hope. I kind of have a, a similar thing to that. I have a shame that I feel like I don't provide enough for my family, for my wife, and for my kids than that I actually feel like I should or that I should be at this point in my life or or whatnot. And however much I can financially, spiritually, and we have a great life, I always feel like I need to provide more and I'm supposed to provide more and I'm kind of failing them. So I'm, I feel shame about that just because what I'm supposed to be doing in my mind and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. If you could do one thing differently now, what would it be? Starting now? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. If you could just snap your fingers and that one thing would be different, you'd be different in that way, what would it be? I don't know. I don't know, know the answer to that. It almost sounds like you're chasing like a, a mirage. That yeah. You don't, yeah. I've dealt, have dealt with that same thing mm -hmm. and still do. But for me, it goes that when I feel the feeling of, I want my wife to be able to stay home and not work. And there's things we can move in our life to make that happen. But in our current circumstance of life, the option is for her to be at work if we want to live the way that we live right now. And I feel, you know, shame and a lack of value for who I am that that's not where we are. So, for, but for me, it goes back further to one of my bigger shames of I was, I failed at school and I wore that for so long in my life as I mean, now that I'm older and I have a job, it seems small, but that was such a giant wound in my life as everyone around me had their masters and were high leaders at places. And I was in fields where that existed without that stuff. And it felt like I was faking my way through stuff. And I always needed to prove how smart I was. And I just wore this wound of, I was a giant failure at this one thing that I needed to be able to do to achieve my dreams career-wise. And I always felt like I was hitting a wall. So then when I get to a place now to where situations where I feel like we don't have the money that we should have, I dig back into that shame of, of I failed, you know. So along those lines, um, a couple of, well, it's probably been about seven years now. Um, I started working on my doctorate degree and just... While I was working on on that um, degree, all of my grandparents passed away. And it was just this season of this person died and this person died and this person died and I'm working a 40-hour-a-week job and I have a family and, um, you know, i still trying to be um, – keep up with my homework and all of that. And and so I, I had to stop. Like I, I had to stop. And it just bothers me that I didn't finish what I started. It it comes back to mind, you know, mm. like, oh, but now it's been so many years, I would have to start over. And that whole thing, like this money that I wasted and, you know, it, it's just, it's shame. It's shame. Like I have that shame that I didn't finish what I started and I really, I, I wanted to do that, but the life life circumstances really prevented me from being able to to complete that. You know, something that um, I normally do with clients when when in this situation um, is asking them what they would say to their kids in that scenario. Um, 
you know, there's so much to just say for cutting yourself some slack. I mean, you had so much going on. Um, what do you think you would tell your kids if it was if it was your own daughter? You couldn't help what was going on. And if that's something that you wish to pursue in the future, then you absolutely could continue and go and pursue that. But at that moment, that was not, it was not God's plan to be pursuing that at that moment. You had other more important things to do to take care of the other people that needed to be taken care of. Sounds like good advice. I'm bad at taking my own advice. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, something that keeps uh, rearing its head back, but that I've learned to uh, how to handle better is um, my anger. Um, I didn't know, I knew I had an issue with anger, but I thought it was a normal issue. Um, a ministry that Sea Life has uh, that I took advantage of um, is called Authentic Manhood. And I went to Authentic Manhood and gave me a community, a platform, just an environment to share uh, that. And I got to explore why I have this issue with anger. And I was so motivated uh, to uh, even request a meeting with um, the uh, Forney campus pastor, Nick, um, to chat with him about it. And he rec recommended uh, counseling uh, for me. And so, you know, through that counseling, I've had the time and had to pour, put in a, a ton of effort into understanding why I struggle so much with, with anger. And it's affected the people that I love the most, of course, which, which hurts and brings the most uh, shame upon me. Um, but um, now I kind of look at it not as a debilitating uh, type of shame, but, but something that I know that I can handle uh, better. And, and take in a positive direction um, and slow myself down and just process uh, these thoughts and these feelings. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that keeps rearing its, its ugly head for me. Yeah, anger is um, one of those, you know, it's a God-given emotion, but it's a secondary emotion. Um, usually it's uh, something underneath, like shame even, um, or embarrassment or something like that that triggers it. And unfortunately... Usually it comes out on other people. Yeah, I identify yeah. with that, absolutely. And it can be a cycle, yeah. for sure. And really that's one of the things about shame. Maybe, maybe as much as anything that we're talking about in this series, it's so easy, isn't it, Lauren, mm -hmm. to just take it with you you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think of the, the, the sin issues in my own life that, that, that I carry with me. I mean, it's been 30 years, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think about, and I think in my own life that that when I think back on it and, and, and what happens now is I have this false emotionalism that I've already been forgiven by God completely and totally. And I return back to that for this false emotionalism. And what I found is, is that, you know, there, there's a story in the Bible um, where, you know, this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery, she's thrown right before Jesus. And, and you may or may not know the story that, you know, the, the, the Pharisees walk away one by one. Jesus kind of puts them in their place. And that's all, and that's the part of the story that's really always the most interesting uh, to us in our preaching. But at the end, he says to her, he says, does anyone condemn you? Hmm. And, and she says, no one, Lord. But the most important person there is herself. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she's talking about the Pharisees, but really inside of that is no one, no one, yeah, do you, do you even condemn yourself? No, I don't. And then Jesus says, now go and sin no more. I mean, really, he just said, knock it off and then go on your way. You're forgiven. And that's just a crazy thought to me. I mean, I feel like we should be beat up a little bit, don't y'all? I mean, I mean, based on the stuff that I've done, I don't know about you guys. <laughs> y'all may be saints. But, you know, I mean, I'm looking at my own life back then. But then, I, but then what's crazy is I carry it with me. And 30 years later, I'm trying to bring back up what Jesus already said. Go, forget it, move on. Don't do it anymore. And, and I haven't, but I'm still going back to that same kind of thing. Yeah, I think condemnation is um, others. I think of it as others condemning us and shame is us condemning ourselves. Wow. Um, yeah. And so oftentimes we're, we're free and no one's condemning us, but we're there carrying around our own con 
condemnation. Yeah, and, and that's the, you know, the verse that kind of we've thought about this week is, is Romans 8, 1, which says, there is now, therefore, and, and therefore, and therefore, you know, what's that therefore, right? It's in light of, in light of the, in light of the fact that I keep doing the wrong thing. This is what happens in chapter seven. I keep doing the wrong thing over and over and over again. There's a battle waging. I can't figure out how to get past it, but Jesus, more than that, has overcome everything. There is now therefore, in light of that, in light of that, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, when I, and when, I, when I hear that, and when I, when I think about that, um, I recognize that it's really honestly sinful for me mm-hmm. to keep, lopping back on myself the condemnation that Jesus Christ lifted off of me at the cross. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I really think about that, you know, kind of regularly. And, and, and why do you think people keep returning to shame, Lauren? I think at times it feels comforting Ooh. almost. I know Ooh. that sounds, <laughs> like it doesn't that. seem like it would be, but I think at a lot of times it is comforting, especially if you've lived in it for 30 years, like you mentioned, um, that's what you know. Um, you know, and a lot of us grew up with parents that did shame or, you know, would literally say shame on you. <laughs> um, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's what you know. I think you go back to what you know. Yeah, and, and shame is a tool. Yeah. I mean, you can get people to behave mm-hmm. with shame. You can get people, including yourself, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can use shame on yourself. You can get people to behave. You can get people to give. You can get people to attend. You can get people to serve. You can get people to perform mm-hmm. using shame. It's a wonderful tool, but it's not a tool of God. Yeah. It's a tool of the enemy. And so we want to make sure that we don't let him win. And we remember what we find um, in 2 Corinthians five 17. I'm just reading it here. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that's, that's not just change, by the way. That's interesting. This is not just changing your behavior. This is an exchange of your old identity for a new. Mm-hmm. And so if we can begin to walk in that freedom, um, I think that we're gonna be really blessed um, in the days ahead. So what can a person do to see themselves? And this is for you, Lauren. What can a person do to begin to see themselves as completely new Mm. and to see themselves as shame-free, to just let go of that baggage? Well, I think step one is you have to say it out loud. Uh, Brene Mm. Brown says shame Mm. can't, uh, shame dies when you speak it out loud, essentially. That's good. Um, You know, shame lives in the dark. So you got to say it out loud to somebody. Um, And then second, I think um, memorizing that verse, for, for example, there's there for... Uh, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, Finding other scripture uh, about what God has to say about us um, once Jesus shed his blood for us and um, reminding yourself, just what you just said, I think that is so powerful to to remind yourself, who am I to say, uh, you know, what I should be condemning myself when, when Jesus paid it all. And and I will say this, and and you know, just for even at home, you know, or wherever someone is watching this, you do want to be careful in your circle of confession. You know, circle of confession needs to be equal to circle of influence. And, you know, and, and, and there's some sin that, once again, that's 30 years old for me or, or that, or that um, Brooke has all the way worked through and all that, that kind of stuff, that, that, that sometimes that's available here. But you, but you need to be thoughtful. And that's why I think therapy and even, you know, things like, you know, our journey groups, um, where, where, you know, you've got this safe space where you kind of learn how to handle it and that you've re- recognized whether or not you're reckless um, even in your confession yeah. uh, that can hurt other people. And so sometimes I see that. And so, so you know, that's, that's certainly understandable. Even in, your group, even in your groups right now, depending on how long you've been together, mm-hmm. probably, you know, to the extent of how much sin you're gonna confess in regards to this, this particular issue of shame. But here's what I know. There's a great deal of discussion that needs to be continued in your group and in your time. And so we're gonna be praying for you and we're grateful that you joined us and we'll talk to you next week. 